Our deep learning day, counter don't cancel, is about our values, what and who informs and influences our values and how we can have better conversations in our community about misogyny, toxicity and hate. Through a series of workshops led by Year 11 boys, external speakers and teachers, we have supported our Year 8 pupils to explore online influences who are associated with both positive values and also misogyny to look at how social media works to influence us. Uh, I'm expecting maybe to learn like much more about like equal rights and stuff. And maybe to learn like how to challenge it, how to deal with it if you see it. For maybe for example, bullying. I think that's what I'm expecting to see. Maybe three uh, students from Year Eleven here to help uh, all of us to have that kind of conversation. As we I'm going to ask the Year Elevens to go around to the different to the groups and help them help them have their conversations. The idea behind counter don't cancel is essentially trying to create spaces for dialogue, um, dialogue between the university and the schools dialogue in the classroom between teachers and pupils, really to, to shift the conversation um, and to provide counter narratives to quite dangerous and harmful discourses. When we got involved in the Deep Learning Day, we took a, a counter don't cancel approach mm -hmm. because I think it's quite important that those young men who already feel like they don't have a voice mm -hmm. don't get shut down. That's what we do at university and that's what we're hoping to embed in a school culture as well, because these boys are then going to be the boys that we're going to see in university in a few years' time. And if they've already got the confidence to talk about these things and challenge difficult perspectives, then I think this bodes very well for moving forward and moving into higher education. I do think you know that challenge around what is acceptable discourse has changed, particularly post 2016 and the kind of wider political shift that probably means that they're now exposed to role models of all kinds who say things that wouldn't want to have been deemed acceptable to say um, and the difficulties that they face in navigating, learning how to navigate social media. Uh, I think social media has uh, influence on people by showing like things they're into, for like example, things that are trending like in this month or this week, for example. It can be used as a tool to like help people, but it can actually be a tool to influence people in a bad way. I do think that presents a challenge for us as educators, but actually creates a, a quite a a unique set of circumstances for those young men that, it, that it's difficult for us to appreciate how challenging it is. I saw many misogynistic comments and there was lots of uh, like hateful and homophobic like language so I wanted uh, to stop this in um, our school so, so I talked about it. He advises young people and young people want to be like him and that's a bad thing because young people have to like choose what they want to be but it's kind of like uh, Andrew Tate is kind of like giving them a uh, it's like guidelines or what, what to be like. Kids in the classroom referencing him a lot, calling him top G, kind of echoing his sexist views and stuff like that, especially in PSHE covering difficult topics like gender equality and misogyny. The boys try and engage in conversations and I think the first thing for me was they were engaging in it before I was ready for it and before we were ready, ready for it because it's all on social media and it's not the social media that I or my peers engage with, it is targeted at them. As teachers we found ourselves having to go and talk to each other, do a bit of research on who on earth this guy was and why are they, why are they all talking about him. Especially since if we just cancel, there might be somebody else who comes and takes Andrew Tate's place, which won't really help us. It might be a more short-term solution. If we completely find a way to go against these messages, somebody like Andrew Tate might come on like in later years, but nobody would really mind that because they already know not to follow that type of stuff.
many of the things around um, Andrew Tate and the things that people have become alarmed by are in fact not new. Those those misogynistic attitudes and the sort of casual sexism that sits underneath. At the end of the day, they are young boys who want to idolise someone, something, especially in the way the world is at the moment with such, uh, there's so many problems, so many social problems, they need someone to idolise. I've been a bit surprised as to how much that that has had an effect, the, the messaging through social, social media and the internet has had an effect and has really, really permeated some people's um, experience of their masculinity. And it's really difficult when you're fighting against things like cookies that build up on their social media that mean they only ever receive one viewpoint all the time. Uh, but we are trying very hard to make sure that they're understanding lots of different viewpoints rather than just one. They can't cry, then they have to uh, have like a girlfriend and the only way they could um, fit in is to have some of these key points and maybe there's one the scalp. We're kind of looking at this idea of what, what, is a, what is being a, a young man, what does it mean to be a man, what are the social ideas about being a male in society today. So what we're trying to do is to deliver those things about misogyny and idea of being men in our tutorials and in PSHE. In order to tackle negative stereotypes around masculinity here as a teacher, a male teacher in the school, um, I think there's a few things that we can and should do and a lot of them go to just being a good role model for pupils. So if we can strengthen the way in which they have a sense of themselves and the way in which they can build positive relationships with uh, other young boys, with girls, with people inside school, with out of school, with adults, with their peers, then actually we're enabling them to deal with the kind of challenge that he presents in a much more robust way. And all of those things can be done before we even start talking about Andrew Tate, and I thought uh, your approach of printing out all those attitudes and pieces of paper and getting the kids to critically analyse it. Why is he actually saying this? What's he saying? Do you actually agree with what he's saying? I think that was a really interesting approach to take, get them to think critically in a more deep thinking way. I thought that was really effective. I found that it was normally best to be kinder to others and not try to fit in to like ways that other people might suggest to you. So follow what your heart and your mind tells you, not what other people would tell you. We paired up with William Ellis School to deliver a deep learning day called Counter Don't Cancel. And the idea behind that was that it's very easy for somebody uh, who's at university to look at some of the abhorrent, hateful, misogynistic um, hate speech that we're seeing online from influencers like Andrew Tate and immediately want to close it down. So we gathered together a lot of material that Andrew Tate has um, posted online through various channels. Um, some of those things were actually very positive and inspirational and some of them were hateful, misogynistic and really, really difficult um, messages. The way he speaks about females isn't that right, but then he does say other stuff. So it's not all bad, but the majority of the time it's really bad. And I think it's quite negative to hear as a 13 year old boy, because that's kind of, if we're seeing all these things, we're kind of going to go by what he's saying. So like I know for myself not to go with that because that's wrong. And I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's too much. Thinking critically about these attitudes and these messages that are being conveyed to younger teenagers who are very impressionable, I think, yeah, dissecting them and analysing them in that kind of way is really needed at a lower level in the school. To try and think about why they're actually absorbing these views and what they actually think about them. But I think the university approach is really important. Ask yourself, is this true? Uh, is it a positive message? Uh, what's its purpose? Something that I thought worked really well was giving them space to identify where a message had come from and about what its intent was and, and actually helping them to, to address that. I think the idea of um, understanding something around banter, some of the messages that we, that we showed seemed like they were quite fun and we gave them a bit of space to sort of laugh and deal with their immediate emotions. And then we unpacked some of those messages and said, okay, so what really lies behind that? 
Um, yes, like for example, Andrew Tate, um, he targets teens because they're like more vulnerable. They they're more vulnerable because they haven't made like actual like, decisions in life that will be as important. It's trying to deliver to them all the information, not what they just hear on social media or, or hear from friends. It's trying to put everything out there. This is what Andrew Tate might say, but there's a meaning behind it. Allowing the students to reflect on the full implications of what they're saying, um, often helping them to explore you know, the, the full meaning of the language that they're using, which, and they might not be fully aware of, of that actually, is, is really important. I think it's so important as well um, to let them share their viewpoints, even if we might disagree with them. Um, and make a point of saying that we don't disagree with the person, actually we disagree with the things that they're saying. So trying to counter their views um, has been a real challenge, but real, really purposeful. I mean, one of the things that's reinforced for, for me with students in conversation is how many of them actually want to be upstanding citizens and role models in society. Um, we wouldn't want to cancel or even dilute their voices. I think it would be really useful to have, to have sort of, I don't know, a, a bigger community of say like alumni or just male teachers in general who are displaying positive traits of male behaviour that we can all praise and look up to rather than having, you know, who's in the spotlight is a man who's extremely hateful towards men, women and really harsh. Let's give them better role models. Let's give them someone who's done something positive for their community. Marcus Rashford, for example, he's an excellent sportsman and he's raised all this money for charity and drawn attention to a, a problem that is really real in our society, in our community as well. Trying to challenge um, misogyny when we hear it, which we do, but challenge it in a way that doesn't elicit a kind of withdrawal response from the people where they double down on their opinion. Um, so try and challenge it, try to really spotlight good role models in society, in sport, in, um, in entertainment, and to be good role models ourselves. You sort of, you can understand their perspective more if you relate to them rather than not look down on them, but like, you know, try to be a teacher. Um, and you can get the message across easier and they'll actually respect you and listen to you. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the older students' roles in the school when it comes to talking about misogyny and, and things of Andrew Tate is for them to be kind of like role models. Because I think the, the older kids have such a massive influence on the young kids' views and how they act and how they behave towards women, trying to model that good behaviour. But I do think when given opportunities to be responsible and to be role models, I think they really can step up. It feels more like a conversation. Like you feel less like you're being taught something and you're like, you're getting different perspectives on things. Uh, yeah, it feels like you have more of a sit in your school. What we need to do is empower them to be positive, both in their use of language and also in their role modelling for each other. And there is a space, I think, where Middlesex University students can be potentially going to schools, presenting their work, uh, talking to students about the issues in a way that resonates and connects with pupils. But having somebody younger, I think that helps them have a bigger picture. So if we talk, for example, about microaggressions, is there a role in um, undergraduates perhaps helping older students to deconstruct that so that our Year 11s who are delivering some of that content to the younger students are actually more expert in what they're saying and, and we can start to use that language more powerfully in our discourse. Something else that I thought worked really well was having our film students there because they're young adults that the pupils can look up to and relate to and they did ask them questions and they're excited about film kit and they, they can see that we're interested in this issue and we're invested in it and we want to hear what they've got to say. So flipping the Andrew Tate idealisation on its head and bringing in young men that they can see themselves reflected in, in a really positive light. Perhaps that would be something that would give them something to aspire to. Young men who've gone to university and who um, are doing their best to eradicate mass, uh, toxic masculinity and everything that 
um, Andrew Tate's promoting. Now after that one deep learning thing from like a couple years ago, and from this one, there's going to be less of, less of which are going to hurt more people, and less Andrew Tate, which is, I think, it's better. If we want to support young boys to call this stuff out a little bit more as teachers, I think there's a training need for teachers first. And I think that governments need to recognise that and put money aside to train teachers and not only train them, but support them. I think they probably did really respond well to having Year 11 boys talking to them about things because I think you'll find lots of the Year 11s actually don't buy into any of the Andrew Tate things. It's, it's often the younger boys. I think it's quite useful to have that sort of inter-year relationship building. There's a real interesting space that we can we can occupy in supporting schools uh, in developing tools, materials, resources which teachers can use in the classrooms that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer messaging. Address equality, diversity and inclusion and make everyone feel safe when they're in our environment. What's really great about this work is that we're making progress all the time but it's not a it's not an easy fix. It requires constant attention. It requires um, legacy work to make sure the really good work that we've done, for example, with this school is continued. My parents have seen like it's positive that the school are doing this because no, I don't really know a lot of schools that have a whole day where they just focus on like trying to help us improve as like males and stuff and kind of just knowing when we're going to grow up, how it's going to be and different things. So especially like I think my parents really, really, really think it's positive that the school are doing this. Yeah, I think the whole key to it is just going to be that we maintain it and keep it going and make sure that it's not just a phase. And this is around sustained learning. It's, it's not something that can just be done in one workshop and that's what I think in the schools and the work that we're doing with changing the culture is so important in that it's, it's looking at a long-term project. This important work will help us think about the role we all play to promote positive values and form manifesto for the school.